Hey YouTube, here's another piece of long form content that we're dropping nice and high. This is of a keynote that I actually did a few months ago uh, for an audience that had no idea who I was. So it was interesting to say the least where I go in and I talk about the, the four elements of high performance and how you can use it to create flow states uh, and basically just crush whatever it is that you're doing. So make sure you check it out and let me know what you think. And what's interesting, because you know what's really interesting? I'm gonna be talking about performance today. And I don't know about you, but one of the things that I do know is the quality of our life really ultimately comes down to our ability to perform in the different areas that we work in or the different areas that we show up in. Who would agree with that? Okay, awesome, three hands. We've gone from two to three, we're getting better. This is what we call progress. So let me ask you a really basic question and it's gonna sound like a loaded question but I wanna get you guys to engage with me and have a little bit of a conversation. If I could share with you the knowledge that I've gained in the last 20 years in performance, who would wanna learn a little bit about that? Okay, awesome, you don't even know where it's come from. You guys are very keen. So the last 20 years, I spent the last 20 years trying to master business. And do you know what I worked out? It's impossible. You can't master it. Okay, it's constantly changing. It's constantly innovating. There are things that are constantly happening and moving. And who's identifying this with social media and the internet, right? It's hard to keep up sometimes. But what I've found that has remained relatively static is performance. And for the last 20 years, I've been studying performance, specifically in business, but also in the areas of professional sports, also in the areas of specialist military operations. So I've got a massive, I've got a massive interest in performance, but the interest in performance that I have is at the highest level. Like I'm talking about in high risk scenarios, high pressure scenarios. How is it that elite special forces and elite professional athletes can maintain incredibly high levels of clarity, in some cases while they've got bullets zinging and cracking past their heads and mortars exploding around them? Who would like to learn how to manage that kind of stress? Well, the reality is you probably don't need to, and if you do, fuck, maybe you need a different job, okay? <laughs> but what I do know is that when it comes to performance, one of the biggest things that prevents us from performing at the highest level is what do you think? Who experiences stress on a regular basis? You know, stress is a really common thing these days. And once upon a time, stress was very useful. Do you know when you used to get stressed, like back in the caveman days, is when you had a fucking saber-toothed tiger at the door. You had a legit reason to shit your pants. Nowadays, there's no saber-toothed tigers around anymore, are there? Well, they are, but they're not real. Do you know where they live? They live in your head. So one of the things that I've been obsessed about, as I said, for the last 20 years, is learning how to perform at the highest level in the most difficult circumstances. You know, and even as, as, as little as like two weeks ago, I spent two days training with the Navy SEALs in San Diego. Six weeks before that, I had four weeks spent in Ukraine training with the Special Forces from Europe. Like I've trained with elite professional athletes from a whole range of different disciplines. You know, I've done over t uh, 210 skydives, at, skydives in a 12-month period just to work out how to perform under immense pressure. I actually set myself a challenge to see if I could get my heart rate under 80 beats per minute whilst actually in free fall. And so I learned how to meditate in free fall. Who thinks that sounds fucking nuts, right? But I did it because I wanted to learn how do you manage your psychology when you are hurtling through the air towards Earth? Because if I can do it in a situation like that, if I've got a difficult customer, that's going to be easy. Does this make sense? So I am obsessed with performance. And what I want to share with you guys today is a little bit about how you can perform at a much higher level. Because ultimately, whether it's in your relationship, whether it's in your health or it's in your business, the way you show up fundamentally affects the results you get. Who agrees with this on some level? Okay, just a little bit about me before we get in. Oop, let's go backwards. How do I go backwards? That way? Okay, a little bit about me before we actually get into this. Um, I failed every single subject from year one to year 12. Aren't you glad you came, right? I was diagnosed with ADHD and dyslexia at the age of seven. I was told I was learning disabled and I'd never learned properly. Um, and basically, for those of you who don't know what ADHD means, ADHD means that I have an untapped amount of energy, about to focus on multiple projects at any one time. True story, it's a fucking upgrade, <laughs> and I know you're jealous. I also have dyslexia. For those of you who don't know what that means, that dyslexia means that I have the unique ability to look at every problem, situation, opportunity with a very unique perspective to see things that most people can't, to do things that most people won't, because they can't see what I fucking can. Does this make sense? Now, do you know what's really funny? I tell people this story, and, and then I have people come in the back of me and go, cool, I want to be really successful. I'm like, dude, what's the problem? He goes, I don't have ADHD. It's like, <laughs> Talk to me for five minutes, I'm pretty sure we'll find another disorder. It's all good, all right? <laughs> but that's a great example of performance. Performance is the ability to look at your current situation and see it better than what it really is and create a meaning different from the one that's given you that will empower you to do better things than the meaning that you had. Does this make sense? So apart from that, I have had seven near-death experiences. Uh, and I'm not just talking, oop, I tripped over and hit my head. Last one cum uh, culminating in a, in a near-fatal stroke that happened in 2009. My very first near-fatal accident, I don't know if you can see the scars I've got on my wrist here. At the age of 15, I got drunk for the very first time uh, on a very masculine beverage called West Coast Cooler. 
and uh, whilst I was on my second stubby, I was living in Townsville at the time, a mob of roos went jumping past. Now, how long are we going for time here? Okay, I've been on for four minutes, is that right? Yeah, okay, all right, just calculating, good. So, kangaroos come jumping past, and I go jumping up with the stubby of West Coast cool in my hand, I go running after the, the kangaroos. I went running down a hill chasing these kangaroos, but I didn't see that it, the, the, it was on dusk, and I didn't see that there was a, um, a drain at the bottom of the hill. Put my foot in the drain, fell forward to the bottom of my hand. Cut all my nerves, all my tendon, main artery. Um, taken to hospital, 13 and a half hours of microsurgery. surgery, woke up the next day, doctor said, hey kids, sorry to be on cell, see you're gonna be disabled. Bonus, you'll be eligi eligible for disability pension. <laughs> I swear to God, that was his fucking punchline. That was his silver lining. 12 months of rehab, I had to take nine months off school, full time. I was in rehab, full time, okay? And it wasn't like, you know, celebrity rehab. It was like the, the rehab where you had to work every day, hour and a half into the rehab every day, hour and a half home, hour and a half to two hours in rehab every single day. 12 months later, I sat down with the doctor. He said, show me what you can do. I started doing this. And he looked, he leant back on his chair and he looked at me, he goes, what you're doing is medically impossible. He says, is there anything you can't do with your hand? I said, just that. And he says, well, you give me the finger. I said, well, you told me I was going to be disabled. He said, I had, a, I had a medical obligation to give you a worst case scenario. And I said, well, I have the obligation to tell you, you're a dick. <laughs> Got a little bit heated. Security was called. I was escorted off to Townsville General Hospital grounds and told to find another specialist. Now, <laughs> true story. <laughs> Who'd have thought? He's not that obnoxious. But here's what's interesting. I think that was fundamentally the most formative thing that ever happened to me in my life. Because I was told at the age of 15, and not only was I told in a very traumatic and dramatic way, I was told that I was going to have my ability taken away from me. My able ability was taken away from me. And I made a decision in that moment that, no, 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 I'm getting this back and I'll do whatever it fucking takes to do that. And I worked really hard. I worked really hard. I applied myself for 12 months and I now have about 90, 90 almost 95% use of the hand as a result. And it taught me some really fundamentally important lessons. The first one is, don't listen to what people say is impossible, even if they're a specialist, because in most cases, they're just giving you an opinion anyway. And this served me really well, incredibly well, because at the age of 34, um, I had a stroke, completely random, completely out of the blue. Within three hours of having the stroke, I lost the ability to communicate, and I had a 15-second memory. Now, the only thing that a 15-second memory is good for is hiding your own Easter eggs. <laughs> and unfortunately, it wasn't Easter. Okay, but I was meeting new people every day, or actually every 15 seconds. It was only short-term memory that was affected, long-term memory was fine. But what was interesting is what it meant to me when it happened. Because when I sat down with the doctors, the first thing the doctor said is, this could be permanent. And when they started giving me the worst case prognosis, where do you think my brain went? My brain went back to that 15-year-old kid who was like flipping the bird at the doctor, and I stopped listening immediately. They said, you'll be off work for at least 12 months, maybe more. I was back at work six weeks later, and you'd never know that I've had a stroke. <laughs> but my point being is this, we've all got a story. The, the, and I've only told you two of the seven near-death experiences. If I told you just about the near-death experiences, we'll be talking for the next four hours. But my point being is, every single one of us has a story. Who would agree with that on some level, right? But have you noticed how some people use their story as a reason or an excuse not to be able to do things? Okay, and some people use their story as the reason why they do the things that they do. The only difference being is what the story means to you and how you frame the game. Because I don't know about you, but I've actually met plenty of people that have very low intelligence who are incredibly successful and very wealthy and have great relationships and incredible health. But I've also met people that have, you know, four PhDs, you know, more, more degrees than a thermometer, and we stick that up our ass sometimes if you're at the vet. That kind of came out the wrong way. But you get my point, right? It's got nothing to do with the qualifications that we have and everything to do with how we manage our own internal game as we play life every single day. And that's what I want to talk about with you guys today. I want to, and as I said, I've only got 60, 60 seconds. It sounds like I'm talking like I've only got 60 seconds. Who would agree I talk fast? Would you like a strategy for it? Listen faster. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I can present a two-hour keynote in 60 minutes. Added value. <laughs> but here's the thing. I literally only have 60 minutes to communicate a message to you. The message I'm about to communicate to you, I'd normally communicate it over about three to four hours, okay? So, you know, these guys have asked me to give you as much information in a very short period of time as possible. So now that you know a little bit about me, now that you have a little bit of context where this is coming from, I've also stu studied under a horse, I've studied horse psychology, dog psychology, human psychology, but everything I've done has been practical. I'm not a textbook kind of guy. I work with horses, I work with dogs, but most importantly, I also work with human beings and a lot of them. I work with people in special
special forces. I work with people in, in elite professional sports. I work with people in elite professional businesses as well. But the one thing that I'm really good at is getting people to perform better than they did the day before. Some people can laugh. Uh, sorry, yeah, well, most people can laugh. Some people can sing. Some people can dance. Some people are good looking. Some people can play an instrument. I can't do any of that. Okay, but the thing that I can do is show people how to get more out of themselves. So you guys ready to learn? Wow, so fucking pumped. <laughs> but it's kind of embarrassing, right? Like you want to learn how to perform, yet I ask you who wants to learn how to perform, you're like, yeah. <laughs> There's got to be a level of commitment, guys. And I'm happy to give, I'm, look, I'm going to give it to you anyway. But I just want to reflect to you right now how you're showing up. And you're not showing up as a high performer. Because high performers, when someone comes to a high performer and says, I have got a 1% strategy, I have got a 2% strategy, would you like to learn it? Do you know what they say? Yes! What have you got? Give it to me now. What is it? I would love to know. But do you know what the 99% say? Oh, yeah? I mean, all right. Oh, maybe, oh, yeah. well, maybe I'll take a few notes. Oh, I'll think about it. There's a huge difference in the psychology of learning between a high performer and someone who's just average. And I don't know about you, but average is just so common. It is. High performance, that shit's rare. That shit gets noticed. But most importantly, high performers get paid. Have you noticed that the greatest performers on the planet are ones that make the most money in any discipline? So let me ask you the question again. I'll give you a second chance. Who would like to learn how to become a high performer today? Just do it. Hey! That's my crew. All right. No need to fucking yell. All right. So let's talk about performance. There's two types of performance. I don't play in the middle. As far as I'm concerned, the middle is the bottom. There's high performance and there's low performance. To me, anything other than high performance is just low performance. Now, that, now again, I know this doesn't give a lot of room for, for people to be average. I don't think there's anything wrong with average. I just can't play that game. It is not in my fucking DNA and it's not in my psychology. Although maybe it was a long time ago, but I've literally completely worked it out as a result of the amount of work that I've done. So what we're going to talk about today is what I've learnt okay, over the last 20, 20, almost 22 years, 23 years now, when it comes to performance. There are four things that we need to understand. But the first thing that we need to understand is consciousness. And you might be thinking, come on, what the hell is, con are we going to go all fucking woo-woo now? No. But we are going to explore the importance of being aware. Because one of the things that I know when it comes, I don't care if you're talking about performance or if you're talking about how to become a better manager, okay, or a better owner. One of the things that I know, if you want to become better, what do you first need to identify? Where you suck. Where you're good and what you need to do in order to get better. How do we identify where we are? What is required? There's a level of self-awareness that's required. There's a level of self-assessment that's required. And one of the things that I've observed, you know, working with some of the highest performing individuals in the planet, is they have, in most cases, and nearly all, a very high level of self-awareness. They are very conscious people. And what we understand about consciousness, what the science tells us, is the brain processes 16 trillion bits of information every one second. That's a lot. That's a shit ton of information. That's a lot of data. That's a lot of bits. But we're only conscious, on average, of about 2,000 bits of that information. Because the brain is a cognitive miser. It's constantly trying to conserve energy. And the way that it does that is by filtering large volumes of information, summarizing what it sees, and giving you small details. You, there is so much more going on right now than you are literally capable of being aware of. Why? Because most of you, if you became aware of every single aspect of every single thing going on around you right now, you would drop into what's called overwhelm. Information overload, too many bits of information, we drop into overwhelm. We drop into overwhelm, what does that trigger? It triggers stress. What happens when we trigger stress? Cortisol's released. And when we trigger cortisol, within seven minutes, we halve our IQ. And when we halve our IQ, what do we do? We make mistakes. We do stupid shit. And in most cases, we can often end up shortening our lifespan. Mother Nature doesn't like this. Okay, she wants to expand our life. So she does that by ensuring that when we become, in some cases, stressed or overwhelmed, that we actually check out. Now, stress, for most of you, you've, most of you have been lied to about stress and been told stress is a bad thing. Stress is not a bad thing. Stress is beautiful. Stress is the weight that's required to lift if you want to learn how to become resilient. But most people avoid stress, and as a result, they don't know how to lift it when it shows up. But if you learn how to lift stress on a regular basis, you can become stronger so that when it does show up, you just pick that shit up and move it out of the room and drop it somewhere else. Does this make sense? So, consciousness. Why is consciousness so important? We are constantly filtering information. That's just how we work. That's what our brains does. We're conserving information. Okay? And we pop what's called scotomas. Scotomas are what's referred to as a psychologically induced blind spot. They typically happen as a result of psychological conditioning. So, for example, has anyone ever, you know, maybe you've been looking for something in the kitchen and you've gone to the cupboard to find it and you've opened the cupboard door and you've gone, hmm, I can't find the salt. 
And then you re call out to your significant other, honey, have you seen the salt? And they say, it is in the cupboard. And you go, ha, 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 no, it's not. I'm looking in the cupboard, it's not there. And they go, yes, it is. They put it back last night. You go, no, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes. And they come in and they go, what the fuck is this, bozo? And you're like, ice. And it was like literally six inches from your noggin. Who's had that happen? Or you're walking around going, oh, I can't find my keys. I can't find my... And they're in your fucking hand, right? <laughs> but the key, the key indicator there, or the key symptom is there, is open the cupboard language. I can't find the salt. I can't find the salt. I can't find my keys. And the brain responds accordingly. It, it responds. The brain is just like a processor. It's a computer. Input, input information. Okay, it reacts and responds. I can't see my sunglasses. I can't find my sunglasses. Okay, there are no customers around. Life's really hard. It will filter out all the information, okay, to give you the proof that what you're asking for is actually true. Does this make sense? So what I'm suggesting is, if you want to be a high performer, there are certain things you need to start becoming aware of. It's just as simple as that. Nobody in most cases becomes a high performer by accident. It does happen. Some people are just naturally gifted. And those people, we just want to high five them, right? in the face, <laughs> with a chair, because they suck, because we have to work so hard. But we shouldn't look at them and think that there's anything wrong with them. We should look at them and actually appreciate what they can teach us. Does this make sense? Because we can learn a lot from high performers if we're willing to humble ourselves and check our ego at the door. So when it comes to the psychology of performance, there are four elements in a psychology, OK? Four elements. First element in a psychology, oh, by the way, this is the building block of how psychology is built. The reason I like to go into this, into the building blocks of a psychology, is because a lot of people talk about, who's heard the people talk about mindset or psychology? And you hear these words intermittent, but often when I ask people, what is a psychology or what is a mindset? And if I ask 30 people what's a mindset, I'll often get 30 different answers. So what I want to do here is I want to give you a context for what a psychology is so we all have a common language. Does this make sense? Yes or no? Okay, so there are four things that make up a psychology. This is the foundation of how a psychology is built and also how a psychology is, is, uh, is shifted as well. The first foundation of a psychology is the stories, okay? I also refer to that as code. Every brain has been coded, okay? The way we transfer information, the way we transfer knowledge, and the way we have done for eons is through sharing what? Stories. You know, once upon a time it was, around, it was in the cave, then around the campfire, okay, and then it was around you know, the, the table, and then it was around the radio, then it was around the TV, and now it's around the internet and, and, and personal computers, laptops, and now it's also around the mobile devices as well. We have been educating people through stories for millennia, and we're going to continue to do so. But that's how you've been programmed, that's how you've been wired. And some of the stories you've probably had suggested to you at some point is, money is the root of all. Well, we must have been, do we all go to the same fucking school or something? Do we have the same part? You know, money doesn't grow on. Ooh, okay, that's interesting, isn't it? These are some of the cultural stories that are ingrained into certain societies. And what's really interesting is when you look at the economic development of the certain societies that adopt these stories, it's quite interesting when you look at the area of entrepreneurship. And Australia is a perfect example. You know, we actually have a condition in Australia that very few countries have. Do you know what it's called? It's called the tall poppy syndrome. I've actually got my American mates that are like, fucking tell me about this tall poppy syndrome. It's just so foreign to me. Because in the US, it's nowhere near as prevalent. So you have been conditioned with stories since a very early age, but you weren't just told about that money was the root of all evil. Whoever had their parents fight, whoever saw their parents fight and heard them use and drop the word money. Okay, fantastic. So not only were you told that money was the root of all evil, you actually saw through the stories that you watched your parents fighting and they dropped the key word money. You go, oh, it's true. My parents are fighting. They're talking about money. It must be evil. And then you sit down on a Saturday morning and most of you are as fucking old as I am. Who's, oh, I'm not going to say how old I am. I'm old. I'm 43. Good. Oh, fuck, you're laughing. You know, once upon a time, people just go, that's old. <laughs> like, I don't feel like I'm 43. I feel like I'm like 21. Anyway, where did I go before that? What was I saying? Money. Ah, oh, you're old as me. That's right, you're all old. So, <laughs> before I insulted you, who here used to sit down on a Saturday morning and watch cartoons? Okay, who's watched a lot of cartoons in their life? Like a lot of TV. Now, how does the TV represent wealth, especially in cartoons for kids who are being trained and conditioned through these stories. Is the wealthy guy the good guy on the hill that is really philanthropic and building charities in all the cartoons? No, who was he? Evil. He was the guy that sat on the fucking hill eating small children. We look at Simpsons, right? Okay, perfect example. You know, Mr. B Mr. Burns. 
you know, the, the evil dude who owns the dysfunctional nuclear power plant. But that's the epitome. And as children, what do we do? We go, it's true. It's true. All these stories are true. All these stories are true. And then we reach 15 and we start to go, hang on, I feel conflicted. Because if I want to go and have fun with my mates, what do I need? I need money. But I've been told money is bad. And so what we find is when people have what's called a tangled hierarchy or they're in conflict when it comes to what they're being trained and conditioned with when it comes to money psychology and when it comes to their environment being, I need money, is these people have this amazing ability. They'll actually go out and make money. But what they typically do is they'll always make just enough in order to get by and never any more. But if they do, they have the most fucking creative ways to get rid of it really quickly. <laughs> Who's noticed this? This is a perfect example how as individuals and as families and as communities and collectives and societies, we are programmed. You can brainwash anyone. And do you know how? And again, I've studied all the CI tactics for brainwashing. And do you know what they do in order to brainwash people? They basically put them in a room. You know, they wire their eyes open. They keep them awake for extended periods of time and they constantly bombard them with the same message over and over and over and over relentlessly. Relentlessly. Rel now, who's, who's got a little voice in their head? Yeah, the people who aren't putting their hand up going, I don't have a fucking voice in my head. <laughs> Everybody has a voice in their head. Question is, are you listening? Question is, who do you think it is? We all have the voice in our head. And who would agree, Some, sometimes that little voice is like, it's fucking relentless. Like it'll sit there and like sledge, 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 or up it. But who would, who would agree? It can be relentless. That is what we refer to as the, the, uh, the automation of the programming. Because once you get programmed, automation takes over. Okay? Your psychology takes over and puts that stuff on loop and starts looping that story over and over and over and over and over. And then we form the next basis of our psychology, which is called our beliefs or our belief system. And our belief system is responsoring for filtering all incoming information. Because what we believe will determine what we see. If we believe that everyone is bad and everyone is dishonest, what will we typically see? We will see people who are bad and who are dishonest. Does that mean that everyone is bad and dishonest? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, we got some work to do. That's all right, I like a challenge. No, it doesn't, because here's what I've observed. Like attracts like, you know? There are all, we are literally like a bag of, you know, licorice of all sorts. There is, there, there is one of everything, and sometimes a few of too many. But what we do know, and who has got enough experience with this to know that whatever you focus on, you see? Whatever is, you know, Buddha said it himself, if you believe you can, or you believe you can't, you are right on both accounts. I think he said it something like that, but you get my point, right? Our beliefs determine what we see. Now, let's, let's relate it back to the financial story. If you've got a shitty, who's, and who knows people that have shitty financial stories because you see them talking about it all the time. Who's observed that your own financial story needs some work just through this conversation? Thank you for your honesty. But when we start looking at belief systems around money, if you have a shitty coding when it comes to money and making money, what do you think your beliefs will do when it comes to seeing income opportunities that are around you? Let me give you a perfect example. Okay, I recently moved, uh, oh shit, it was about a year and a half now, but I was living um, over in Mossman with my wife. We went into this store, there was some, some, some road works was being done at the front, and from the moment we walked into the store, okay, it was a woman's boutique. For a good 12 and a half minutes, all I could hear was this whiny fucking voice carrying on about, there's no clients, there's no customers, there's no customers. Like there was the, uh, either the manager or the owner of the shop was sitting there whinging and bitching to the sales assistant. We walked around for 12 minutes, no one saw us. My wife grabs something off the rack, takes it up, sorry, my ex-wife now, puts it on the, I'm not sure if this is why we're, she's my ex-wife, but puts it on the rack, and then the lady's like, oh my God, I never saw you there. And I, I wanted to say it, but I had to bite my tongue because I have to do that a lot. I'm not fucking surprised because you're carrying on like there's no one here. I'm surprised you can even see us now. Does this make sense? Because when, when you condition yourself, even when that thing is in front, even when the salt is sitting right in front of you, if you don't believe it is there, you won't see it. It's as simple as that. Then our beliefs then create the foundation for the next layer of our psychology, which is our value system. And our value system is nothing more than our motives, our reasons for doing things. And the way that you've been programmed, the way you've been conditioned, okay, the way you've been trained and the way you've had your psychology built will determine the things that motivate you and the things that don't. 
Have you ever wondered why when you offer you know, a pay rise or a big financial incentive to some people, they get all excited, but they actually do fucking nothing? Who's found that sometimes very strange? Because some, most people think that they're motivated by money. Because here's the thing. Who believes that they have a value on money, like a real legitimate value on money? Okay, there's one or two people. So here's the thing. Then the next question I ask is, who has more than enough money and doesn't need any more? Okay, no hands are up. So here's the thing. If you have a legitimate value on money, you'll have a lot of it. Why? Because if you, are, if you legitimately value money, you'll be motivated by the activities and the things that will bring that money in. And the proof of that will be the accumulation of money. Because here's the thing. If you value something, you behave in a way that demonstrates that. Would you agree with this, yes or no? Most people don't value money at all. Most people resent money, but they think they want it. But the reason that they resent it unconsciously is because of this conditioning. Does this make sense? We must become aware of the things that we move towards and the things that we move away. Because if you're not, because here's the thing, I don't value money. That is very, I have become acutely aware that for the last 30, for almost 43 years, I have not had a very high value on money. Why? Because up until maybe 12 years ago, no matter how much money I made, as soon as I made it, within three months, it was gone. Now I've accumulated a lot more, which would indicate that I have a higher value on money, which I do. It's still not up in my top 10. But what I've learned to do is I've learned to associate the things that are important to me. My number one value is my son. And now what I've associated is the more money that I make through business, the more time and the more quality time and the more things I can actually do with my son, the more secure my son becomes. I've nearly died seven times. I could drop dead in the next 10 seconds. I'm fully aware. I can't get insured. So for me, I have to build, I'm, I'm, one of my goals is to build such a big pile of cash that anything happens to me, my son's all right. Not in a way that he's going to be sport for the rest of his life, but in a way that he's, not, that he's going to be well taken care of. Does this make sense? So I'm very acutely aware, I'm very self-aware of the things that motivate me, okay? But I also understand that I can link values together. So although money isn't a genuine value, if I connect it to family, it will then motivate me to do the things that will bring more of it in. You guys with me on this, right? Because what I've observed is most people just aren't motivated by money. It's as simple as that. That doesn't mean it's bad. It's just being aware and knowing who you are. Know thyself. Which then produces the fourth element of your psychology, which is your identity. Who are you? Okay? Who are you when you're not doing what you're doing? Because you know, some people, when it comes to money, Come on, I'm just not good with money. Come on, I'm not a people person. Come on, I'm just not really cut out for you know, this kind of an environment. Come on, I'm just doing my, my, my very best with what I've got. How you see yourself, and by the way, doing a lot of steps up here. This becomes a symbiotic loop. Because how you see yourself will determine the next set of stories that you lay down. And if you see yourself that isn't someone that's not good with money, then you'll just perpetuate those stories. But here's what I know. When it comes to shifting your psychology, there's only one thing you need to do. Like literally, there's only one thing that you need to do. Actually, no, I'll go as far as saying two. Who can do two things? Oh, fuck. <laughs> Really? Really? How about we try that again? Who can do at least two things? Okay, fantastic. I'm inspired by you, okay? The first thing, you, guys, let's look at this. The therapy industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. The personal development industry is a multi-billion dollar industry where people in many cases are paying thousands and tens of thousands of dollars to learn how to shift psychologies and behave in different ways. I'm offering to give you 23 years of distilled research and tell you if you do these two things that will fundamentally radically increase the probability of your psychology shifting and you don't have to give me squat. Would you like to know what they are? Yes. First thing, thank you, thank you, you guys are awesome. Develop a higher level of self-awareness than you did yesterday around the stories that you're, that you're saying internally. Because it's not until, again, first step in, 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 first step in, in, in changing is you've got to identify what the problem is. And for most of you, you have this automated sequence of emails that are running through your head, being sent, received, open, and read on a regular basis. And the reality is you've got to stop the chain. You've got to delete the chain, and you've got to start constructing new emails. You've got to start constructing new codes. Because you might be surprised to know this, but you can have anything you want in your life, anything at all, because I've done this personally and with thousands of clients. You can have anything you want. All you've got to do is create the statement that affirms it to be true and read it out enough to the point where it becomes unconscious and then it becomes automated, okay? And then over time, it just starts to naturally happen. Okay, it's called, in some cases, an incantation. In others, an affirmation. In some cases, it's called, you know, a goal. I, want, I, I am stronger. I am a master of influence, persuasion, and sales. Whatever it is for you, you can just start, a, start with a statement, you get where you want to go. 
All right, the second element of performance that we need to become aware of are our emotions. And here's where most people don't realize the destructive nature of emotions. Who loves experiencing emotions? Okay, all right, I'll ask this question. Who loves having a glass of alcohol? Okay, now, who would agree there's a difference between being able to have two or three drinks and not being able to stop? Same is true with emotions. Now, let's battle test this. You might be thinking, well, that's, that's impossible. Who here has ever been, like, drunk? Like, I'm talking proper drunk before. Okay, excellent. And who here, whilst under the influence of alcohol, did something stupid that you actually were able to remember the next day when you woke up, and you woke up and you went, ooh. Okay, and now I'm getting some audience participation. Okay. Who here has ever been highly emotional before? Either angry, happy, sad, but to the point where you did or, say, did or said something, but then when you calmed down, you thought about it and you went, ooh, probably shouldn't have done that. Who's got a level of self-awareness that would agree that when you're emotional, you don't necessarily make your best decisions? Who would agree that when you're drunk, you don't necessarily make your big best decisions? Of course, right? What we need to understand is emotions are like alcohol. They intoxicate us. And although some of you might drink a few beers before work, <laughs> it's not fucking recommended. Okay? Just like okay, you might enjoy you having you know, a life full of emotion, but it's not necessarily going to be the best thing for you. And let me explain why from a performance perspective and from a business perspective. So when we look at emotions, I look at an emotions based on a spectrum. Okay, you've got high, po oh, that's very blue. You've got high positive emotions, which relate to what I re refer to as high energy, high positive emotions, what I call extreme happiness, extreme levels of ecstasy. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got low negative emotions. Now these both actually relate to charge as well. High positive, ah, yeah. low negative, those kind of, who understands what I'm talking about? Just so we've got the, okay, so it's a spectrum. And then we have what's called the pendulum. And the pendulum is essentially what we do between and around our emotions, which is we normally swing backwards and forwards. Okay, this is the pendulum, we swing between high, we swing between low, and we often swing this part, past this little part, point in the middle, which is called neutral, which is absent of emotion. I also call this conscious, I also call this present. Okay, some people call it boring. Okay, I call it, you know, a taste of enlightenment. Now let me tell you why I say that. What do you think is required in order to maintain a high positive state? In order for you to be like, <laughs> Oh my God, life's so good. Everything's amazing. Oh, everything's nothing but to celebrate. What do you think is required psychologically for you to stay in that heightened state? What is required? Drugs, alcohol. You guys are, I, I'm, I'm tempted to come back tonight. <laughs> Got to tell you. Got to tell you. Very tempted to come back tonight. Okay. What we know about emotions and the positive and negative is when you are in a high positive state, in order for you to maintain a high positive state, you literally have to filter out all downside in your life. Because have you ever noticed that you can't be happy and sad at the same time? Unless you're on drugs. <laughs> you can't be happy and sad at the same time because when you're happy, you're focusing on things that make you happy. When you're sad, you're focusing on things that make you sad. And if you're sad and you start focusing on things that make you happy, then you're not going to be sad anymore. You'll start being happy. I know, right? Better than a fucking pill. But what we know is when you're in a heightened state, in order for you to stay in the high positive, you literally have to filter out 50% of your reality in order to stay there. Let me tell you why. We live in a world based on duality, where there are equal parts positive charge and equal parts negative charge. It, it is from the foundation up of our universe. Okay, there is a duality. There is a balance in nature. It's just how it works. In order for you to stay here, you literally have to filter out every possible negative aspect of your life in that moment. Every positive next negative perspective of whatever it is that you're doing in that moment. Now, let me give you some context to this. Has anyone ever been in a situation before where someone got you so excited, you saw now no downside whatsoever? None whatsoever. You were completely pumped and you just jumped in balls and all. And then six weeks later, you're like, ah, oh, fuck, I didn't consider any downside and I got burned. Who's ever had that happen to them? That's a perfect example of the destructive nature of emotions and how they affect our psychology in the way that we receive and filter incoming messages. When you're in high positive, you will literally ignore all negative input and all negative information because you want to maintain that high. And it is a fucking high. When you're high positive, you're high. You're on drugs. You are drunk. That's why people love emotions, because they get you off. Okay? And it's free. You don't even have to buy a drink. But on the equal and opposite side, in order for you to stay in a state of low negative, guess what you have to filter out on the other side? You have to filter out the other 50% of your reality. 
in order to stay there. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been in business for long enough to work out that in order for me to optimize my performance in my decision-making capabilities, I need as much fucking information as possible. Who would agree with that, yes or no? Now, when we start bringing emotions into business, when we start bringing emotions into the game, we literally sabotage our ability to make good decisions because we start filtering information at a global scale and at a local scale in order to maintain the chemical rush, in order to maintain the chemical high. Now, there's also a physics to this as well, okay? I've also got a mad interest in physics. Who's heard of CERN, the Large Hadron Collider? Been there twice, interviewed three of their top physicists. In fact, just finished coming back from Canada, I interviewed three top physicists in Canada. Why do I like, why do I like quantum mechanics and particle physics? Because here, here's the thing. The more I learn about how reality works, the more I can play with it. Let me just say that one more time. The more I understand about how reality, legit fucking reality, not Newtonian, like cause and effect, I'm talking quantum. I'm all the way down playing with M theory, okay, and unified field theory. When you start to understand how the world shapes itself from this quantum soup, you start to think very differently, okay? You start to think consequentially, but you also start to realize there's a lot more going on when things are created than just, I put an intention out there, or I just did a little bit of work. But here's what I know about physics and the physics of emotions. Who's done basic um, physics 101? Does anyone know the charge of electron? Okay, the charge of an electron is negative. So let's say I grab an electron, okay, from an atom. An electron is what orbits the atom. Okay, and I grab it and I pull it away and I put it in a vacuum chamber. What charge does the electron have again? Negative, negative what? Charge. Negative? negative. What is it? Negative. negative charge. Now I release it into the environment. It's a little negatively charged subatomic particle. What's it going to do? What's it going to naturally do? It's naturally going to seek out its equal and opposite and either annihilate itself and have that energy redistributed into the system, or it's going to find another atom, okay, or another uh, nucleus to orbit around, and it's going to go into harmony, okay, because there'll be, balance will be restored. Now, what the fuck has that got to do with emotions? Who has ever been really excited before? So excited, okay, and who's observed this? Does anyone notice that when you get really excited that you seem to attract people that want to piss on your parade? <laughs> okay, right? And who's noticed that it can sometimes happen with remarkable timing? Like literally get excited, two seconds later they show up and they're like <laughs> <laughs> Who's actually got first hand experience of this by show of hands? Nice and high, nice and high, perfect. Okay, so we've all experienced it. So then we're like, hi, someone come pisses on a parade. Oh, that's just terrible. Now, by the way, that person pissing on your parade, they didn't do it to piss you off. They were sent in by the universe to get you back into the middle. The middle is neutral. But you have this thing called an ego and you take shit personally. Okay, and you don't take it at what it's designed to do. You go, well, that person's got it in for me. Like, ah. <laughs> and then you go down to low negative. Now, who's noticed that when you're in low negative that you'll typically often manifest or create people around you to come in and pick you up and support you? Who's noticed that? Who's noticed that it's sometimes literally the person who just pissed on you? <laughs> it can happen that fast. And again, th they're not doing anything other than responding to the call of the universe, which is, dude, you're out of balance. Okay, I need to correct you right now. But again, they correct you and you start feeling more elated again. You go screaming past neutral back up into ego territory and it becomes this, for some people it's like fucking <laughs> But who would agree? It's like sometimes it's like good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. You have up, you're up, down, you're up, down. Who's, who's experienced this? An extreme level, we call that bipolar. <laughs> it's true. But what's interesting is if you've got the general population to take the base bipolar level, most of you would show up as an, as, as an indicator on the spectrum. Why? Because who has good days and bad days? That's, and I'm not saying that's bipolar, okay, because I've got family members that have been affected by it. I know there is extremes on the spectrum, but what I am saying is we all have experienced what, on some level, what it's like to have a good and a bad day. So here's what I know, is when you are supercharged, highly charged, highly positive charged, you become a shit magnet. You do. And you will attract things to you to neutralize you. But until you work out how to play here, you'll often be going in swings and roundabouts, up, down, back, forwards. And all the universe is trying to do is, dude, is say, dude, I'm just trying to get you into neutral. And do you know what, the, do you know what is in neutral? That, because people go, well, I, I want to experience emotions because that's a richness of life. Are you kidding me? You're not seeing more of life when you're emotional. You're seeing less of life. Now, don't get me wrong. I experience emotion on a regular basis. I'm just not an addict. I know when I'm under the influence of emotion. Okay, and when I am under the influence of emotion, I choose the things that I do very carefully. And if I do, am required to drive a vehicle or make decisions under the influence of emotion, I know how to step back, put myself into a present state, take a few deep breaths, center myself, remove emotion so I can step back in very quickly 
to be objective in my decision making. Does this make sense? As performers, whether you're an owner, manager, it doesn't matter where you play, but if you want to play at the highest level, you need to learn how to manage your emotions. Money flees chaos. Money flees emotions. When the, market, when the stock market is emotional, when the stock market is in emotional chaos, what does the money do? It flees. Where does it go? It goes to the, the closest point of safety. It goes to where is there not chaos? Where is there certainty? Where is there emotional stability? And in most cases, if the stock market's in chaos, what will be looking pretty? Property. So the money will go into property. Okay, when property is all emotional and people are selling all emotionally, where does the money go? It'll go to the next asset class or it'll go back to the stock market. Money flees emotional chaos. So if you're a performer and you're trying to create more of this substance that you need in order to scale, in order to grow, in order to be, to be considered successful, then you need to start looking at your relationship with your emotions. And by the relationship with your emotions, I mean, are you an addict? Because what we also know, based on Candace Pert's work, is not only do emotions, um, uh, not only are they bioidentical, not only are the emotions bioidentical to drugs, we also know that they're just as addictive. We know that they are just, your emotions are just as addictive as nicotine and heroin. Who here knows people that just are angry all the time? Okay, and who knows people that love getting angry? Who's actually felt really good when they're angry before? It's quite a powerful state. Like when you're angry and you're clear, you know, you've got adrenaline, you know, you've got norepinephrine, you've got all these chemicals and you like feel, ooh, and some people get that and go, ooh, I like this. Ooh, I'm gonna be fucking angry all the time. And they become angry people. Some people, who knows people that are always so excited you just wanna fucking slap them. <laughs> all right? Same, same. We are, we, in order to perform at the highest level, we need balance. We need balance in our psychology and we need balance in our emotions. It's really that simple. And how do we balance our emotions? First of all, we apply a level of awareness to who we are. We apply a level of awareness to our situation. We ask ourselves this question, am I emotional right now? And if you are, then you either need to learn how to regulate in the moments or you need to learn how to, learn how to step away for a few moments and learn how to develop the tools to regulate those emotions so that you can come back to the situations with a much bigger picture. Because I don't know about you, but when I make decisions, I want to know the upside and the downside, because if I'm missing one, chances are I am going to make a mistake. Do you guys get where I'm coming from with this? Let's talk about frames for a second. Frames is nothing more. Now, I refer to this as frame control. You might want to write that down. I'm not just talking about frames, I'm talking about frame control. And frame control is an incredibly powerful trait of a high performer. What high performers have the unique and innate ability to do is look at every situation opportunity as every, look, sorry, they have, the, they have the capabilities to look at every situation as an opportunity. Now, how do we do that? We do that by, by consciously managing the way that we view things. Because when we talk about framing, okay, let, let's look at this. Okay, what is that? What is it? Who said sunrise? Okay, who says sunset? Well, one person, you're both fucking right. It's a sunrise, because could that be a sunrise? Yes, could that be a sunset? Yes, what determines it? What meaning do you apply? What does it mean to you? Now this is fundamentally really important when you understand that every single event that's happened to you in your life, everything that's happened to you, everything that's happened to you, you chose the meaning in that moment, in most cases unconsciously, based on other references that you had or what other people told you that it meant. Why is it from the moment my stroke came on that I chose not to listen to the doctors and I looked at it as a gift of enlightenment? Okay, and as a result, I've seen nothing but you know, that come as a consequence. The highest performers in the world can be sitting there eating shit, but they'll be looking at every piece of shit and going, mm, this is exactly what I need in order to get to the next level. Because what we know about people who have frame control is they have this incredible ingredient that the Navy SEALs are constantly after. It's called grit. Now, the Navy SEALs, for the last like an almost 100 years since they've been going, they have never been able to get past a 20% completion rate through what's called their BUDS training. BUDS training is the six weeks before SQT, SQT, which is SEAL qualification training. BUDS training normally finishes with one week. It's called Hell Week. And Hell Week is where they basically clear the shelves. And programmatically, between 78 and 82% of people will quit in that final week in Hell Week. Do you know why? 
because they can't manage the meaning of what's happening in those moments. The pain becomes so great and they see the pain as a barrier, not as a doorway. And what we now know, and the US government has spent millions of dollars on this, is there is one, one determining quality, one determining trait that is the difference between someone who becomes a Navy SEAL and someone who just becomes someone who tried out for it, like the thousands of others who did. And do you know what that, that trait is? It's grit. And grit is the resilience, the ability to push through when things get tough. But the only way that we can push through when things get tough is being able to, by being able to manage what that thing means when we're pushing through it. By being able to manage what the other side has installed for us once we get there. Who knows people that no matter what happens to them, everything is a problem? Okay? Do you like being around these people? Yeah, Jesus, it's the same person. <laughs> No, we don't. Why? Because we, we refer to them often as being what? Pessimistic. Now, I'm not... Because here's the thing. Now, let me, let me give you the, the, the fucking... The, whatever, something amazing, right? <laughs> Who here has ever had something really bad happen to them? And then six months to two years later, you look back and you went, wow, you know what? I'm really glad that that happened because if it wasn't for that happening, I wouldn't be where I am today. Who's actually had that? That's called frame control, okay? But for most people, frame control happens with time, and time gives us perspective. I am talking about how do we hack hindsight. The way that we hack hindsight is by asking a couple of questions. Something happens, good, bad, in between. Let's say it's bad, something bad happens. You ask this question, what's the benefit of this? How is this serving me? What is this giving me that I didn't have before? And what skills, knowledge, and experience have I gained from this that I'll now have tomorrow to be bigger and better when I show up then? That's what high performers do. High performers control the meanings that they attach to the situations they're in. Everyone else just is the victim of the label. Okay, ADHD, what I told you, that's just a frame. Okay, I've had doctors argue, say, you can't say, yes I fucking can. It's my frame. Your frames. You have the ability to choose your frames. Most of you are, have inherited frames, like you've inherited your fears. You're only born with two fears, everything else you borrowed. And most of the frames by which you are viewing life through right now, they're not yours. They were someone else's that were given to you, you know, because they thought it would be helpful and it's helped you to now. But every now and then you've just got to check in the luggage, all right, and maybe not just pick it up when it's on the carousel. Maybe go and buy some new stuff. Okay, because whatever's in there, you may not necessarily need. And lastly, and this is my favourite, you know, this is, um, has anyone here heard of a guy called Stephen Covey? Uh, he wrote the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, when my first business went bust, I went and worked for him for two years, uh, turned their business around from a $7 million loss uh, to a $5 million profit in 18 months just by showing them how to market differently. But one of the things I learned from, from Covey was when I first arrived, um, it was basically you know, in Brisbane, uh, it was like a telemarketing kind of role. I sat down and my manager came up and he goes, dude, there's only, two th there's only one thing you need to know. At 10.45 and 3.15, you just got to look busy. That's all you need to do. I was like, what? He goes, there's a thing called minimal observable behaviours. And I was like, uh-huh. He goes, minimal observable behaviours are the behaviours that people see in the minimum amounts of time that they see you. And so if someone sees you busy, if they only see you twice a day and they see you for five minutes each time and they see that you're really busy every time, they will apply that perspective to your entire day. And they'll think, well, he must be busy all day. You guys with me so far? So he's like, you only need to be busy twice a day. 11.45 and 3.15, I was like, what the fuck is wrong with this place? But this is where I learned about performance and how we measure performance based on behaviours. Now, you're either going to play in one or two places, okay, when it comes to performance. And we're talking about execution here. When it comes to execution, you're either playing above the line or below the line. People who play below the line, okay, these are the people who are activity focused. And they are addicted, addicted to being busy. They actually pride themselves on telling other people how busy they are. In fact, they wear it as a badge of honour and often will compete with others when they talk about who's the busiest. Who knows somebody just like that, right? Okay, but what's interesting is most of us have been told if you want to be successful, you have to work hard. Yeah, but I don't know about you, but if hard work was the actual key to success, who actually thinks that they've actually earned the right to be a lot more successful than what they are? Yeah, true story. It's not hard work, please get me, don't get me wrong. Work ethic is ridiculously important, but most people apply a great work ethic to shitty things that produce no results. And as a result, they work very hard, but they don't actually get the returns and rewards they're after. Can anyone relate to this on some level? Okay, I'm sure most of us can, because most of us have been there. And some of us sometimes fall in between. But what that comes down to is playing below the line. And people who play below the line, they're the people who start, start lots of things, 
but they don't actually finish a great deal. You know, they love starting things new because they love that feeling of new. They love that feeling of the honeymoon phase. And who can relate to this? Like some people actually become, you know, they, that transfers into their love life. And they will constantly go from relationship to relationship to relationship because they love the honeymoon period. Some people do it in business. And by business, they'll start one business. You know, it'll start building it up and then something dramatic will happen. And instead of trying to fix the problems, they go, well, fuck the business. I'm going to go and start another one. Okay? Who's, who knows someone just like that? Okay? But what we understand is people who play below the line... Okay, they're often very busy, but they're not producing a lot of results. Where execution comes in from a measurement perspective is when we play above the line. And when we play above the line, that's when we start becoming outcome focused. Our focus is on outcome and we're addicted to, almost to a degree, completion. Who here, when you start something, unless you finish it, you start to get a little bit uncomfortable? Almost like, has anyone seen the movie The Accountant? You know, when he starts doing that um, auditing of that business and he has all his numbers up on the wall and then he comes in and people are running it out and he goes, but I haven't finished yet. And it's like, you know, he's on the spectrum, he's you know, getting all out of whack. Who, who can relate to that feeling on some level? If you can't finish something, you get uncomfortable. That's a beautiful feeling because these are the people that are completion oriented. These are the people that you can rely on to actually complete the project, not just start it. And I don't know about you, but where do you think the value is? Is the value in the ability to start something or is the value in the ability to follow through? Really? Do I have to spell it out? Come on, guys. It's in the ability to follow through. Your value... Here's, let me make this really clear for you. Your time... Time is nothing. I don't care how much time you put into anything. It's got nothing to do with it. The, the real question is, how much value do you bring? You know, you can play below the line all day long, be busy as fuck and produce nothing. Okay? But you can work for four hours a day and complete multiple projects and you can deliver enormous value. The question is, where do you play? And most importantly, what is your psychology around execution? Do you actually fundamentally believe in order to be seen as worth, worthy, as in order to be seen to be of someone of worth, I must be busy, I must be constantly busy? Because those are the people who are constantly busy are typically the ones that often underperform and often experience burnout. Who can relate? Can anyone relate to burnout on some level? All right, fantastic. So as I move through to the end of the presentation, a couple of things for you to remember when it comes to performance. The, first, the, the very first and more, most important things, what is your story? And I mean your life story. I started with my life story. And I share with you the reason I am here today is because of the seven near-death experiences. Every piece of shit that I have eaten has given me the right to be here. Okay? But it's the frames by which I view my life that have given me the power that I have to use my stories. Does this make sense? So first of all, I want you to get really clear on what is your story. And if you need to change it, start changing your story. Secondly, you need to apply a level of consciousness and awareness to yourself. If you want to become a legit performer, the best, the, the highest performers in sport, the highest performers in business, okay, the highest performers across any field, they don't happen by accident. They happen as a result of high levels of self-awareness being applied to strengths and weaknesses in order to develop. But when we are talking about consciousness in the area of performance, we're talking about the four areas. We're talking about becoming more aware of your own psychology. But most importantly, what are the stories that I'm hearing and what are the stories that I'm replacing with? We need to become more aware of our emotions. Okay? Do you know when you're emotional? And when you are, do you have the tools? Do you have the breath work to be able to regulate yourself, to get yourself back to neutral so you can see everything you need to so that you can make better quality decisions faster? Are you applying awareness to the way that you show up to the situations that happen? When things blow up, because who here has teams? Who has people that work with you? You are seen, and when you're visible, your team will look at the way that you create meanings from things. And they'll be asking the question, okay, are empowered? Because when it comes to creating meanings, the meaning you create from every situation will determine the response. Who here finds themselves far more effective when they're empowered versus when they feel disempowered? Yes or no? Yes. Of course you do. So choose the meanings that by nature of what they mean, create an empowering meaning that you can use to drive yourself further forward and not hold yourself further back. And last but not least, Become aware of where you place your time. Are you someone that is just constantly busy and you're happy with that and you're addicted to that and you wear that Mickey Mouse badge? Or are you someone that prides yourself on the ability to complete? You may not be able to work on as many projects, but the ones that you do work on, you complete every single time. If there's one thing that I hope you guys learned today is just exactly that, one thing. My goal is you just got one thing from this presentation you can apply, take away and apply in a practical way. But apart from that, you guys, you started a little bit rough. 
but you guys have been amazing. Thank you so much for having me. If you'd like more information, check me out on social media. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Oh, by the way, free hugs. So let me know what you think below. Hit me up. Tell me what you think. But more importantly, uh, this is the first time we've actually uploaded uh, some raw keynote footage. If you'd like more raw keynote footage, make sure you let me know below. But if you haven't already, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can check out more amazing content, longer form as it comes out. Say hi to your mum for me.